thought that I was all alone, broken and afraid, but you were there with me, yes, you were there with me, and I didn't even know that I had lost my way, but you were there with me, yeah, you were there with me. Up my eyes, I never knew that I could never make it without you. Even though the journey is long, and I know the road is hard, well, the one who's gone before me, he will help me carry on. After all that I've been through, now I realize. That I must go through the valley Stand upon the mountain of God As I travel on the road That you have let me down You are here with me Yes, you are here with me I have need for nothing more Oh, now that I have found That you are here with me Yes, you are here with me I can pass from time to time I lose my way But you are always there to bring me back again Even though the journey is long And I know the road is hard For the one who's gone before me Help me carry on After all that I've been through Now I realize the truth That I must go through the valley Stand upon the mountain of God Sometimes I think of where it is I've come from And the things I've left behind The journey is long, and I know the road is hard. But the one who's gone before me, he will help me carry on. And after all that I've been through, now I realize the truth, and I must go through the valley, stand upon the mountain. For oh, one must go through the valley. And the fall of the mountain Oh, I must go through the valley Stand upon the mountain Thought that I was all alone Broken and afraid But you were there with me Yes, you were there with me So this morning, we, uh, we are going to continue our series regarding uh, the seven churches of Revelation, okay? How many of you here are alive? How many are dead? Okay. Have you ever seen a dead person? I am very much pretty sure that you have seen a dead person. How about a dead church? Have you seen a dead church? Okay. How about uh, a comatose church? A dying church. So I remember a story about a, uh, a newly assigned pastor in one rural area. And he was so frustrated because after several weeks, there are only a few handful of people coming to church every Sunday. And then 
with all of his frustrations, one day he went to all the members he knew in the whole area, and he knocked on their doors and said, Come this Sunday, we're going to have a funeral service. And then every one of them are asking the pastor, Who died, pastor? Who died? You will know. Come on Sunday. And everyone came on that day, on that Sunday, and then the pastor preached about the dying church or the dead church. And then after the sermon, he let everyone come in and go inside. I mean, uh, go to the podium and see because they put a casket, okay, in front. And then everyone looked at the casket and they were shocked because every one of them saw a mirror in the casket. And everyone who looked at the mirror saw their own face. Do you understand what I'm saying? There are so many dead churches today. And some of them are attending the church. Dead, no life. It's like zombies walking dead, comatose. Now, let me share with you today our lesson number five. The church in Sardis. That's not Sardines, okay? It's Sardis. The comatose church. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we come before your presence asking for your grace as we study the word. Speak into our heart and help us to realize the importance of this message, especially in our generation. It is our prayer that the life that we have from you will not die. But instead, that fire will continue to grow and move us into new heights, into a new level of serving you. Father, we just entrust everything to you. Break every yoke of the enemy, every doubt, and believe every works of darkness. And let your spirit give us freedom and understanding and revelation of your word. Father, we honor you and we thank you. Let your name be exalted. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Church of Sardis. Revelation chapter 3, verse 1 to 6. So there are many churches that are dead today. Some of them became mausoleum. In Europe, several churches were bought by other religious groups and they converted it into mosques. Okay? And there are several churches. Uh, they're still having services like this, but the people are dead. The people are lifeless. They're just going through the motion. You will notice if the church is dead or not. If they will just going through the motion. Oh, this is Sunday. It's my obligation to come to church. It's my responsibility to come to church. If the mindset will become like that, that is heading to that kind of level, a dying church. Because coming to church is not a responsibility alone. It's not just my obligation. Coming to church is experiencing the goodness and the grace of God. It should come from our heart because that's where the Lord ordained His purpose and His will for the people of God to come together and worship God in spirit and in truth. Coming to church is very important, but nowadays, there are so many people, they are all contented watching on television, and they thought they're having church. If that is the mindset of many Christians, we are breaking one of the principles of coming to church in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, that you come together as 
living stones, as church, as people coming together in the name of the Lord until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, giving the background of the book of Revelation chapter 3, verse 6, or verse 1 to 6 about uh, the history of uh, Sardis. So, 500 years before John wrote this epistle, Sardis was one of the richest, again, one of the most progressive, most powerful cities in the world during that time. They were at the citadel of their success. And people are coming in that area to find greener pasture. So, that place was a, uh, a place of opportunity for a lot of people. Okay? It's like, you know, all over the world, coming to America is a place of lots of opportunities. Amen? Greener pasture. Make, to make more. To, got, to have more. To receive more. To produce more. For more. But again, in that place of Sardis, there are two temples that really stand out. The temple of Diana and her brother, God Apollos, or the Sun God. S-U-N. Not the S-O-M, but the Sun God. That's why they worship Sun. They worship Diana. And according to the history, Sardis was defeated twice in its history. Once by the Persian and again by the Greeks. So the city was built on a mountain uh, above sea level, 1,500 feet above sea level. And it's really hard to conquer that place. So you could only approach from the south side one way. So if you can conquer the south side, you can conquer everything. So, under Persian uh, rule, under Cyrus, so this Persian army tried to penetrate the city for a year without success. They sieged the city from all sides, from all directions, without any success. But the Persian soldiers were so patient and, uh, you know, they're willing really to conquer that city of uh, Sardis. So, one, one, di one night, there was a soldier from Sardis uh, army drop his helmet and roll down the hills. And then that one mistake, he thought nobody is watching him. He went down the hill and took the helmet. And all those persons watching him tried to look and uh, how you call that? Uh, they tried to trace the way the soldier went down from there from his position down the hill. And the Persian army discovered that there are several secret passages that they can go down the hill. That one mistake gave a great advantage to the Persian army and they conquered city of Sardis. We need to understand, when we give one space to the enemy, the enemy is watching, not your neighbor, okay? The enemy is watching, and once you give the enemy a small opportunity, you will just count several minutes, you know, the devil will take place and conquer your life. Hello, are you with me? Now, let's see. The Bible says, the proclaimer, and to the angel of the church in Sardis write, this thing says, he who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So, I don't know if you're familiar with that word, seven spirits, seven stars. 
The seven represent perfection and completion in the Bible. And the seven spirits represent the sevenfold ministry of the Spirit. In the book of Revelation, the seven spirit was mentioned four times. So if you're writing, you can write it down. Revelation chapter 1 verse 4. Revelation chapter 3 verse 1. Revelation chapter 4 verse 5. And Revelation chapter 5 verse 6. So the seven spirit was mentioned in the Bible, especially in the book of Revelation four times. For one reason. It speaks about the the office the work of the spirit now in the book of isaiah i don't know if you can read that isaiah chapter 11 verse 2 the bible says and the spirit of the lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the lord so the seven spirit represents the sevenfold ministry of the spirit and this functions about the seven churches that was mentioned in the book of revelation and in isaiah it was called the seven spirit of god the spirit of the lord the spirit of wisdom the spirit of understanding the spirit of counsel the spirit of might the spirit of knowledge the spirit of the fear of the lord so all of these things function as the seven spirits which are before the throne of God. Now, if you are going to use the reference to that, it speaks about the throne of God in the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation chapter 5 verse 6. It relates to the seven spirits which appear in Revelation chapter 1 verse 4. And, it, and all of these are associated with the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, imagine in all of those churches, Jesus revealed himself in many ways. As the one who died and rose again, the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. So you can review Revelation chapter 1, chapter 2. And now here, chapter 3, he uh, revealed himself in another way. In order for the church to realize and to understand that Jesus is not just an ordinary person, but someone who knows everything. And then the seven stars, Jesus is the head of the church. He holds the seven stars, the messengers in his hands. A faithful messenger carries his word and comes with his authority. And that's why so many scholars are talking about the theory with regards to, the, to, the, to these uh, seven stars. Either those people preaching the, the gospel with authority and, and declaring the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ during the time, or the angels where the Lord is telling them to tell John to write everything. So the fact that the stars are in Jesus' right hand, in the, in, in, in the right hand of the Lord Jesus Christ, so right hand in the Bible indicates that they are important and under His authority. You know, when you use the word figure, figure of speech in the Bible, it's not a literal right hand. That's why they use the word, the, the figure of speech in order for us to understand that right hand means strength and control. It means that God is in control of every situation using the right hand. Using hand. Why hand? Because every human being using our hands for what? To produce something. To tell somebody that we are in control, that we can do, we can handle, we can move, we can, we can operate using our hands. Our hands are important. You might use this to create or you might use this to destroy. So which one do you like? So that's why hands are always important. Using your hand to show your love, using your hand to show the star to that person you love. The positive. And Jesus said, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive. Did you notice all those churches? Jesus said, I know your works. So Jesus knows everything. Hello, are you with me? Jesus knows our works, okay? I know your works, that you have a name. Okay, you have a name and that you are alive. So that's a positive one. It's like a praise. 
Okay, I know your works. I understand what, what's happening, what's going on. You have a name. You are very popular. People applause you every time somebody call your name. So you are always in. Okay, I know your works, that you have a name, that you're alive. That's positive. But there's a problem. And this is the problem. The problems are this in chapter, Revelation chapter 3, verse 1. I know your works, that you have a name, you are alive, but you are dead. What do you think of a person alive and yet dead? That's a comatose person, dying person. Alive, dead. Have you seen a person under coma? A comatose person, a dying person. Sometimes if that person has no relation with you, it's okay. But how about if that person is someone whom you love? Maybe you will say, how I wish I'll give my life to him. How I wish he's not there and I, I, I will replace him. You are willing to give your life for that person, right? Because you love that person. Hello, are you with me? Dying, comatose. I have seen so many. And there are many moments in my life that my heart broke. We are not related physically, but spiritually we are related. And it's not easy to see someone whom you love, whom you cared for, for many years, in that situation, what do you think Jesus feel every time he can see a, 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 a person alive and yet dead? How can you feel? Do you think Jesus is happy when a person is dead? Is alive and at the same time is dead. A person who is comatose, a person who is dying, he died for the church. The problem with this church in Sardis, they are a dying church. Sardis had a great past, wonderful history, but it was fooling itself about its present situation. They are trying to pretend that they are okay, yet inside, they are not okay. Don't you know there are so many Christians today, they are fooling themselves. They are pretending that they are okay. But they are not okay. Inside of their hearts, there's so much brokenness. Inside, inside of their hearts, they are dying. And you know, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Try, keep asking them about their situation. First, they will say, yes, I am good, I'm fine, I'm great. But the more you ask them, the more you will see how their hearts will be rebuilt. All of those hatred and anger and pride and arrogance and lust will come out eventually. All of the actions everything. Sadis had a great past, wonderful history, but they are fooling themselves. They thought they are alive, but no, they are not alive. They are dying inside. There is so much virus inside of their hearts. So how do you know that a body that once was full of life is now dying? So those who are in the medical field, we know that a person is dying before they were full of life, Say, you, you've been in the hospitals, yeah, you've visited people. I've been in the hospital many times and all the relatives, oh, he was so strong before. He was so this and that and this and that. All the good things. But now, the reality is that he isn't that bad. So how do we know that a body that once was full of life is now dying? Organ seems to function. It's not functioning anymore. Essential life-giving needs, no? Begins to shut down. Kidneys, it's not functioning well. Lungs, heart. So one thing after another just stops. 
Sometimes the most painful one is that when the doctor will tell you uh, there are only the brain is functioning. You know, dying church is the same. If the church is not functioning anymore, praying stops, giving stops, God's word no longer relevant, the preacher is preaching only good things, they don't even preach sin anymore. No sharing of faith. They will attend when they like to attend. Attend with it's the only game in town. Church like that offers nothing to a lost world and it's dying. Hello, are you with me? That's why the Bible says, having a form of godliness but denying its power and from such people turn away. Dead works are the works of our hands. And these are works of self-righteousness. And they are called dead works because they lead to death. So this dying church glorifies their dead works. This dying church glorifies the things that they produce instead of the one who gave them, who gave them something to produce. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. So when the church rely on their work, when they glorify their work, instead the one whom they are working, instead the one that, 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 the one that supplies the strength and, and, and all the, the blessings. When the, dying, when, when the church become a dying church, when the church become in a critical condition, That is in a very dangerous condition. And it is my prayer that this church will not be a dying church. Hello, are you with me? That we will not come to that level of a dying church. Dead works, any attempt to find favor or earn acceptance, or be made righteous before God by one's own effort, one's own way, or, or things to do, or ability, or willpower, is dead work. So the Bible says, They are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. So these works are little, because the thing that most keeps people from Christ is the belief that they can be good without Christ. So many people today, they thought they will go to heaven by doing good works. But in the eyes of God, their works are not perfect. They will still go to hell. Because nobody can save us, not even our works, except the one who died on the cross and rose again from the dead. And that is Jesus Christ. Amen? I remember what the French philosopher Blaise Pascal believe and he said this and i quote there are only two kinds of people in the world the righteous who understand themselves to be sinners and the sinners who believe themselves to be righteous in which category we are in that part the reason why we are serving god is not because we are talented it's because of the grace of God. Only because of the grace of God. If we will serve the Lord because of our talents, there are so many things out there that they can, you know, receive a talented person. But in the eyes of God, the most important thing is to acknowledge and see that we are only saved by grace. And whatever we have, we just give it to God back to him amen apart from the blood of christ my conscience and my hands are unclean and my worship and works are dead but in christ in christ not only am i made alive but even everything i do because everything must be for the lord see we do not glory in our deed in our dead works 
We glory in the living Christ because only Jesus provides the clean consciences. Only Jesus provides the clean hands. Only Jesus provides the clean hearts. So only the entrance of the Holy Spirit. That's why if anyone here among us will say, you know, the reason why this church is alive because of me, you are in a very critical condition. Amen. The reason why the church is still alive is because of Him. Amen. Nobody else but because of Him. Amen. Let's give the Lord a clap of praise. The preparation. The Lord said, I know your works. You have name. You are alive, but you are dead. Your works are not perfect. So, prepare yourselves. And he said, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. You see, that's the reason why it, the, 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 the church is in comatose condition. They are still, they, she is alive, dying, but there are still several things, you know, that still functioning in that church. That are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Then he said, Remember therefore how you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. So let's divide that. How to avoid the level of a dying church. So according to the word of God, the Bible says, Be watchful. Be always on alert. Be watchful. If your prayer is not on fire, and if your prayer life is just for obligation, you are a dying church. If the Bible reading is no longer have the heart to read the Bible, and you don't have that passion to do the things that God wanted us to do, we are in that critical condition. That's why Jesus Christ is giving them, I believe this is another big chance for for the church. Be watchful. Be mindful of the things that still remain. Be watchful. Be alert. And then strengthen the things which remain. Now, if you are praying and if you think your prayer is a dead prayer, now it's time to be in that you have to bring your prayer level into a new dimension. Amen? Amen? Your relationship. If your prayer is still, Lord, bless me, bless me, Lord, bless mine, and bless. If your prayer is always I, me, and mine, we have a problem. Strengthen the things which remain. And then the Bible says, remember how you have received and heard all the words of God. So after the service, okay? Try to meditate what we have studied. Did you still remember what we studied last Sunday? The Bible says, Remember how you have received. Remember how you have heard. Everything we receive, everything we heard. So the word, the, the Lord said, remember. What do you mean remember? Remember does not mean you have to memorize. There are so many people, they, they, they are so good in memorization. And there's nothing wrong with that. Remember is not just memorizing. Remember is putting the word into action. So what is the use? You memorize the word and yet you don't put the word into action. The Bible says, action. Oh, faith without action is what? It's dead. Remember how you have received and heard. And then hold fast. Hold fast to what you have. And then repent. If you know something inside of your heart, you're losing your loved ones, I mean your, 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 your first love, and, 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 and you compromise the word, and there's so much things going on in our lives, you know, we need to repent before it's too late. Hello, are you with me? We need to repent. Before it's too late. And repentance is not is what? Repentance is not crying. 
Hello, are you with me? Repentance is change, changing of mind. You have to have a new mindset. David Lee Pathway said, Do what's right and God will do what's left. Hello, are you with me? Then the other one is this. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. He will come like a thief. And of course, you know what the Lord is trying to tell us. Judgment will come. Those who are unrepentant, those who are dying, those who are not watchful, those who are not serious, the Bible says, he will come like a thief. And you know, it's all about judgment. Then the preserve. Those who are remnants. So in the church of Sardis, the Bible says you have a few names even in Sardis who have not defiled their garments and they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. So in the church of Sardis, there are people who did not defile their garments and they walk with the Lord. So two things are very important here. Those believers who are preserved or remnants are those who did not defile their garments. I mean, their, their lives, their, their testimonies, they preserve it. They live according to God's will, even though there are so many persecutions, even though there are so many things going on, they never lift their finger against anybody because they want to preserve their garments. Hello, are you with me? They want to preserve their garments. They want to make their garments, you know, ready for the Lord Jesus Christ. And they walk with Him. So the word walk with Him is very important. So when you walk, there must be unity in your walk. You see, imagine, if, you, if, if, if I will walk like this, there must be coordinates with the other from the left to the right. If I will walk like this, this is not walking. That is jumping. If I will only do like this, that is not walking. You have to understand when you walk, you walk together. When you walk, you walk in unity. When you walk, you walk in continuity. They walk with Him. So no wonder that these people of God in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, they walk by faith, every one of them, in spite of many trials and problems. And there are times they were being persecuted. People are being killed because of their faith. They never lift their finger. They never accuse anyone. But instead, they proved to them and in the eyes of God that they are worthy of God's calling because they can walk with the Lord. You know, a person who is willing and can walk with God, there's, no, there's nothing any in his heart when it comes to the negative things of this world. Hello, you with me? See, it's like... Uh, when I was uh, somewhere in Palawan, I, uh, you know, one of our member uh, asked me to uh, to do fishing, and we use a small boat. So uh, I don't know. Uh, I, that was my first time, and I'm so nervous because there's no how you call that the katig or to to balance that, and. It's really hard. He told me, Pastor, balance your body, okay? And, and, and that, don't move. Too, don't make too much move, movement. You, you, you better sit down and relax. Okay, okay, okay. But because I'm so nervous and, you know, and uh, the boat do, do like this. So some water go inside. And I said, Hey! The water is coming inside. Pastor, use the tabo. <laughs> Take it out. And to make this story short, so we got at least 10, uh, ten tilapia uh, or something like that. You know? And I said, wow, that's good. But he said, Pastor, if you behave inside the boat, we can uh, get more. But because you... You are so nervous and you do a lot of movement. I can't concentrate. 
This is my point. We live in the world, but we are not supposed to be of the world. It's like being in the boat. Boat in the water. Okay? You want your boat in the water, but you don't want the water in the boat. The more you make more movements, you will let the water come inside of your boat. You have to live your life in the world, but you don't want the world to live in your life. Hello, are you with me? Don't make too much movement. Because the more you move, especially in, not in accordance, in coordinance with the master boater, you will let the world or the water live in your boat. This is the promise. There are four stages of Christian maturity. The first stage, a lot of me and a little of you, God. That's the first stage of maturity. So it means they don't appreciate me. I'm the one only, I'm the only one doing everything here. They don't recognize me. They don't, nobody shake my hands. I will not come to the church anymore. Nobody say hi and hello to me. Hello. Are you in that first stage? No, don't say anything. Just smile if you like. Don't raise your hand. Second stage. Some of me, some of you, God. It's like 50-50. I'll do this for you, God, if you do that for me. Lord, if you will bless me, I'll serve you. If you will give me increase, I'll give more. If you will give me favor, I'll do this favor for you. That's 50-50. Fair Lord. Agree, God? Hello, are you with me? So are you in the second stage? The third stage. A little of me, a lot of you, God. I've just got these few areas I can't let go of. Okay, Lord, my hands is yours. My eyes is yours. My ears is yours. But let, let me keep my mouth it belongs to me so I can make more. Let me keep my pocket. I need more privacy, Lord. But okay, 90% belongs to you, but let me have this 10%. So let's reverse, God. Let's reverse. Hello, are you on the third stage? I've just got these few areas I can let go of. Lord, I surrender this, but let me keep this. Anyway, I surrender 99%. Let me keep 1%. At least you have the majority. Hello, are you with me? How about the fourth stage? None of me and all of you, God. I do all things as unto the Lord. Everything I do, I'll do it for the Lord. From head to toe, it belongs to God. In and out, belongs to God. My heart, my ears, everything within me, everything out of me, everything belongs to God. Are you on the fourth stage? It's up to you. So the more intense our church is, the less likely we are to be like Sardis. So instead of becoming Sardis, it is my prayer that we become Sardines. <laughs> the people will come, experience the glory and the blessings of God. And that commitment has to come from every member here. We need to have that kind of commitment. Not just in attendance, but in a commitment to personally make things happen for Jesus. Amen? Remember this, the promise says, He who overcomes, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not, be, I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Remember the book of life and the books in the first stage of what we have discussed. The book of life is where our names are written. And then one day, the Son of God will confess our names 
before the Father and before His angels. Everybody will stand. And then, everybody is, uh, the, the, the Son of God will say, uh, uh, Brother so-and-so is outstanding. Okay. And somebody will say, Come and enter into my rest, my good and faithful servant. Hello, you with me? Remember this, my friend. What is important to God must be important to us. It's not the other way around. What is important to God must be important to us. For example, is your family important to God? Now, if your family is important to God, then your family must be important to you. Is your relationship with your loved ones important to God? If you say yes, then it should be important to you, not the other way around. It's not, Lord, my family is important to me. But let me go to worship you minus my family. We need to understand and realize everything that we have and produce comes from God. So the purpose of the church is like this. To exalt the Savior, to evangelize the sinner, and to edify the saints. That's why we will never give up praying. We will never give up asking God to intervene for our families, for our loved ones, every husband, every wife, every child. Amen? Because they are important to God and it is important to you. Hello, are you with me? The church is important to God, so it must be important to all of us. Amen? Hello, are you with me? Praise God. You know what? I'm meditating, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, one day God will give us a new place. Okay? You know, everyone is excited. Uh, God will give us a new place of worship, a, a building. Okay? And that, we, that, and that is cool. And that is what we are waiting for. But you know, five years ago, six years, seven years ago, when we are still in the old place where we are using, I still remember every Saturday, 30 people coming, you know, helping together, putting up the chairs and everything, you know, cleaning up the place, helping one another. We are enjoying bringing food, you know, and staying together, talking a lot of things and... Then we have this place. Only those who have things to do to come. Those who are assigned to practice praise and worship to come. I hope it will not happen to us when we have our own place. Let it be a place of prayer. Let it be a place of worship. Let it be a place where we can come together and worship together and work together and do things together. Amen. I don't want that place to be a monumental place. That one day it will become a mausoleum. I want that place to be a place of praise. A place of worship. A place where people can come and experience the glory and the power of God. And we, it will only happen if we as a church will become more committed. And there will be continuity in what we are doing. Bringing our people, our loved ones, our families. Because the family that we have matters to God. Your friend matters to God. Your neighbors matters to God. Every one of us matters to God. That's why the Bible says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You see, the secret of finding Disciples in the church, it's not those with the most worldly talents, but those to whom God has their ears and hearts. I hope that at this church, we have the ears and we have the hearts that are willing to say, Lord, none of me and more of you. Shall we all stand? Hallelujah, Jesus.